Praise the Lord, friends. I am so glad that you tuned into the broadcast today. We are talking about all things new. And we begin yesterday in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. And we're going to move forward from verse 17 into verse 18 and 19 and verse 20 today. Talking about all things new. And the scripture actually says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if any person be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and given to us the ministry of reconciliation. And so when we begin to look at this, notice what he says. If we're in Christ, all things have become new and all things are of God. We talked about what that is yesterday. We said that is talking about our, our spiritual condition and what happened in our spirit. You see, a person is made up of three individual parts and they, they flow together, but they are spirit, soul, and body. And Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, he said, I pray to God that your entire, that your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so he says, I I'm praying to God that your whole spirit and soul and body. So I am a spirit. I possess a soul and I live in a body. Now, when we talked about that all things have become new and all things are of God, we said that's really talking about our spirit. And what happened when you believed on Christ in your spirit? You received the life of God. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 says this, You who, you hath he quickened, you hath he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. And we also read the scripture yesterday in Romans chapter 8, verse 11. He says, if the spirit of him that raised up Christ from the dead dwells in you, he will quicken your mortal body by his spirit that dwells in you. If we go back to verse 10, he says, if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is alive because of righteousness. So we've got the life of God. Then we found out not only do we have the life of God, we have the light of God, the very nature of God himself. You know, the Bible actually says this, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we are lying and not telling the truth. That is in 1 John chapter 1. And so praise God, we've got the light of God in us. We've got the life of God in us. And the third thing is we have the love of God in us. That's the nature of God. God is love. The Bible actually says that in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. So when you're born of God, when you become a new creation in Christ, you've got the life, light, and love of God on the inside of you. Now, as, as that your spirit has changed, and so he says all things have become new and all things are of God. But then he says... In verse 18, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and given to us. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. And given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So not only do we have a new spirit, we have a new ministry. And what is this? It says in verse 18, God has reconciled us to himself and given to us the ministry of reconciliation. What is the ministry of reconciliation? You know, I have a young man who uh, actually does worship for me. His name is Aaron Skaggs, and he has a ministry, and um, it's called Reconnect. Him and his wife, Rachel, they have a ministry called Reconnect Ministries. Well, that's what's happened when we get reconciled, and, and they primarily minister to families, husbands and wives, but when, when a husband and wife are in disagreement, maybe they're separated, but they get over their differences, and they come back together, you know what? We call that reconciliation. They reconcile reconciled their differences. So what God did in the person of Christ was God paid for our sins. 
and our sins were separating. Our, our sins were, were actually hindering us from, from uh, moving into what God had for us. And so God took away that sin. So now he paid the payment for that sin so that now that we can be reconciled to God, we can come back into relationship with God through Jesus. And so he says, God reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. I actually believe that every born again believer has this ministry of bringing people to God, of, of telling their story. You know, your story is unique about how you came to Christ, about how you received salvation, about how you were, you know, set free from Satan's power, about how you received the life of God. So he says this, God was in Christ reconciling, making the world right with himself, restoring them to right relationship, not imputing their trespasses to them. So what's it mean when it says he's not imputing their trespasses to them? It means he's not keeping a record. He's not keeping an account. That word impute, if you study it out in the, in the Greek, it comes from the word legizomai. It's an accounting term. And in Romans chapter 4, there's three words that really tie into this. They are uh, impute. They are reckoned and they are counted, and it's an accounting term. And so he, he says God was in Christ, look at this, God was in Christ reconciling, restoring the world, the right relationship with himself, not imputing, not accounting their sins unto them. Why? Because Jesus paid for our sins. And he says, and ha has committed to us, to who? To believers. If you're born again, if you're a believer, if you've received Christ, the word of reconciliation. Now, what is this word of reconciliation? That God's not mad at you, that God loves you, that God loved you so much that he sent Jesus and Jesus has already paid for your sin. So God's really not keeping account of your sin. And all you need to do to be saved is believe on Jesus and receive the atonement, receive the payment that God made for your sin. In other words, it's already paid for, but you've got to believe it to receive it. So John 3, 16 says it this way, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes on him should not perish, but should have eternal life. Verse 17 goes on to say, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Hallelujah. God didn't send Jesus to condemn you. God sent Jesus, you know, to love you, to forgive you, to help you. And you know what? Believe it or not, God is not up in heaven keeping a record of all the things that you do wrong. You say, Pastor, well, I've read about the judgments. Oh, yeah, the judgment. There's going to be judgment. And believers are going to be judged for their works in Christ, okay, for what they've done with Jesus. Unbelievers are going to be judged for their works apart from Christ. But see, Jesus already paid for your sin. And so what do you got to do to go from being an unbeliever to a believer? You just have to believe. You just believe on Jesus. And when you believe on Jesus, you're made right with God. You're reconciled to God. You're restored to right relationship with God. It's not by, by a, a work that you did, an act that you did. It's by your faith in Christ. So I believe in Jesus. I heard the gospel. I heard that God loved me so much that he sent his only begotten son, his sinless, holy, pure, perfect son. He sent him as a lamb, as a sacrifice for my sins. And Jesus died. You know, when John, the apostle, looked on Jesus in John chapter 1, he said, behold, the lamb of God, I think it's verse 29, who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus came to take away the sin of the world. And so, in the Old Testament, when they would have these sacrifices, you can read about this in the book of Leviticus, they, they would have a, a lamb that would come and this lamb would die for the sins of the people. But they not only had a lamb that would come and die for the sins of the people, they had another lamb or goat, and he was called a scapegoat. And, they, and, and that they, they would put different things on that lamb, sacrifice whatever that goat, and that goat would go out into the wilderness. And when that goat went out in the wilderness, he was the scapegoat. He carried away the sin. Praise God. So Jesus was this lamb that died for the sin of the world. And God in Jesus has taken away our sin. So today there is no more remembrance of our sin. That's what the scripture says. 
thank God, you know, we're blessed because God doesn't remember our sin anymore. And that's what this is saying. It's saying that God was in Christ, restoring us to right relationship with himself and not imputing, not keeping a record, not keeping track of our sin, of our trespasses. What is sin? It's to overstep the law. It, if He who trans, transgresses the law, sin is a transgression of the law, according to 1 John. So he said, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So the good news is we, we come to Christ, we believe on Christ, we're restored to right relationship with God, and then God is, was in Christ not imputing the sin of the world, not imputing our sins to us, not imputing the world's sin to them. So the sin of the world was already paid for in the person of Jesus, but we have to believe on Jesus. We have to believe that to receive it. Once we receive it, then he says, He's not imputing the trespasses unto them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. What is the word that we're to go tell the world? God's not mad at you. God loves you. God sent Jesus to die for your sins and pay for your sins. Your sins have already been paid for. So now all you've got to do is believe on Jesus. And you believe on Jesus and you're restored to right relationship with God. And so thank God that we are restored to right relationship, that we are restored to fellowship with God. And so thank God for what Jesus has done. So he says, all things are passed away. He th says, all things have become new. And he says, God has reconciled us to himself by Jesus and given us the ministry of reconciliation. And then he says, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. So God has already paid for the sins of the world in Jesus, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us this word, the word of reconciliation. The word that God's not mad at you. He's already paid for your sins. And all you need to do is believe on Jesus. Now, let me show you something in Romans uh, chapter 4. We're going to turn to Romans chapter 4. I'm going to show you a couple scriptures. Because what Paul's saying in Romans 1, 2, and 3, he's saying the gospel is the revelation of righteousness. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and verse 17, he's saying the Gentiles need righteousness. In Romans chapter 1, verse 18 through verse 32, they're caught up in philosophy, idolatry, lust, all kinds of ungodliness. He says the Jews in Romans chapter 2 need righteousness. They're uh, they're caught up in legalism and they're making their boast in the law. But he says in verse 23, you make your boast in the law, but through breaking the law, every, every person has broken God's law. If you don't believe you have, just read the Old Testament. I mean, I, I can't wear a garment that's made out of two types of material and not break. I'm wearing a shirt that's polyester and cotton. I would have broken God's law and went straight to hell today if I was trusting my performance. But I'm not trusting my performance. I'm trusting the performance of Jesus. Glory to God. And so he says, he that breaks the law dishonors God. And so he says, you make your boast of the law, but through breaking the law. And then, you know, we look at sin in the church as we've got, you know, we've got white lies, gray lies, and black lies. And God says, all liars will have their place in the lake of fire. All lies are sin, right? And so we, we try to put different categories on sin, but the Bible actually says in James chapter 2, verse 10, that, you know, whatever, I'll have to go there and read that. James chapter 2, verse 10 says this, it says, for whoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of it all. Now, that's not just talking about the Big Ten because there's 620 that go with them. There's like 630 various laws. And nobody's ever kept the very first commandment of God, which is you shall have no other gods before me, let alone all the other 629 that go with them. And so he says he's guilty of it all. He says, so you know, you're guilty, and if you haven't received Jesus to, as your Savior, you need to receive him. You need to believe on Jesus now. But when, Jesus, when you believe on Jesus, what happens is God makes you righteous. So in Romans 1, Paul says the gospel is the revelation of righteousness or right standing with God, and the Gentiles are caught up in philosophy, idolatry, lust, all kinds of ungodliness. Romans chapter 2, he says this, he says the Jews, or Churchgoers, religious people, are caught up in performance, and they be they boast in keeping the law, but they through breaking the law dishonor God. Romans chapter three, he says this in verse ten: "There's none righteous, no, not one. Jews and Gentiles are both guilty before God." And so he goes on at the end of Romans chapter three, and basically says God sent Jesus to. Uh, he, I'm going to read this in verse twenty-five. God has set forth Jesus. And he's talking about Jesus to be a propitiation, a payment. 
through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. You say that's past tense sin. All sins are past tense in the sense of the cross. Because when Jesus died on the cross, he said, it is finished. And so all sins are past tense at, at, in, the, in the light of the cross. He says this, to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him who believes in Jesus. So the only way that God could play fair and not play favorites is base everything on Jesus. And when you, you believe on Jesus, you receive the righteousness of Jesus as a gift and you are made righteous. So God imputed your sin essentially to Jesus and Jesus took this, the sin of the world. Jesus was the lamb of God dying for the sins of the world. Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John chapter one, I believe it's verse 29 says that. And so the Bible actually says this in 1 Peter chapter 3. I think it's about verse 18. He says he was the just dying for the unjust being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit that he might bring us to God. Hallelujah. We could come to God because Jesus has already paid the price for our sin. Now look at what it says happened when we believed on Jesus in Romans chapter 4. He says, we receive the righteousness of God. He sent Jesus to declare right standing with God. But Romans chapter 4 verse 6 says this. He says, I'm actually going to read in verse 5. But to him who works not. So we don't, we're not saved by our performance, by our action, by our works. Because our own righteousness is as filthy rags. He says, but believes on him, on God, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted. There's that word counted that we talked about earlier in the broadcast or imputed to him for righteousness. God is not imputing sin to us, but his, our faith is imputed to us for righteousness. Even as David describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness. So God is not imputing sin to you. He's imputed the righteousness of Jesus to you apart from your works or your performance. Saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and sins are covered. Jesus forgave your sins and Jesus covered your sins at the cross. And then he said this in verse 8. This is a wild scripture. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. So you know what? God is not imputing sin to you. He's not keeping track of it. He's not keeping a record. God loves you. God has forgiven you. Praise God. He's made you right. That's the good news of the gospel. Now, this is the message that God has entrusted to us. This is the message of the gospel. If we go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, where we started, and he says this, he says, God has given to us, he reconciled to us, uh, to himself by Jesus, and has given to us the ministry of reconcil reconciliation, to bring people back into right relationship with God. To wit, this is what we're telling people, this is what I mean, so to speak, that God was in Christ reconciling, he paid for the sins of the world, the world unto himself, not imputing their sins to them, their trespasses to them. He that transgresses the law, sin is a transgression of the law, according to 1 John chapter 3, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. This word, this gospel has been entrusted to us. So this gospel is the good news. Praise God. It's the good news that God's not mad at you, that God loves you, that God's already paid for your sins in the uh, person of Jesus. It's the good news that Jesus already took your sin. He already took your sickness. He already took your anxiety. He already took your poverty. And now you can believe on him and you can receive his righteousness. You can receive his, his righteousness. You can receive his peace. Amen. You can receive his healing and you can receive his provision. That's the gospel according to Isaiah 53, verse 4 and 5, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 and 25, and 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. Jesus already took it. He already paid for it. Since he took it and paid for it, you don't have to take it and you don't have to pay for it. Now, that is a ministry of life. I'm going to read to you because in 2 Corinthians 6, prior to 2 Corinthians 5, where we're studying today, it says this. It's talking about New Testament ministry. He said in verse 5, he says, Our sufficiency is of God who has made us able ministers of the new covenant. That's what I'm teaching you right, right now is New Testament ministry, New Testament truth, not of the letter, not of the law, but of the spirit for the letter, the old covenant law, the law of Moses kills 
but the spirit gives life. Remember, we talked about the woman caught in adultery. And when they brought the woman caught in adultery to Jesus, we talked about this yesterday on the broadcast. They said, Moses in the law says stoner, John chapter eight. What do you say? Jesus said, whoever sinned, cast the first stone. And they all left from the oldest to the youngest, being convicted by their own conscience. He says, woman, where are your accusers? She said, none, Lord. He said, neither do I condemn you. Jesus is the only one that had the right to condemn this woman because Jesus is the only one who never sinned. And Jesus did not condemn her. He said, neither do I condemn you. Go your way and sin no more. And then he said, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the very light of life. You see, he doesn't just give us grace and forgive us so we can go on and keep living like the devil, lying, cheating, and stealing. He forgives us and gives us grace so we can let his light shine through us. Let his love live through us. Let his life live in us. And so he says this. Now look at this. He said that the letter, the Old Testament law kills, but the spirit gives life. He says in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 7, if the ministry of death, he calls the old covenant ministry or, or law a ministry of death written in, and engraven in stones. Moses carried down the Ten Commandments in stones. If it was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look at the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance. Did you know there was glory on that old covenant? How much more glory do we have in the new covenant? He says, which glory was to be done away. How shall not the ministry of righteousness? We have received a ministry of righteousness. We can tell people you can be right with God. Jesus has already paid for your sins. Re believe on Jesus. Receive the payment that he made. Now look at verse 9, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 9. For if the ministry of condemnation be glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness. He calls the Old Testament ministry, the ministry of the law, a ministry of condemnation. You know, years ago, I heard about this revival and people said, you got to go to this revival. I went down to hear this guy and there were supposedly thousands and thousands of people getting saved. And man, I, I went to that meeting and this guy got a flashlight and a sword, shut off the lights, thousands of people in the place took this flashlight and so shined it on this sword and walked around the place and talked about sin. All He talked about every kind of sin you could think of. It was a ministry of condemnation. It was a ministry of death. It was not even, and there were people, you know, half the crowd was laying on the floor crying and weeping. But you know, a lot of them just got emotionally touched and their spirit did not get changed because that's not what it's about. You know what, we need to understand that we're sinners and we need a savior, but we also need to understand the truth that when you are saved, you are the righteousness of God in Christ. You know what, there's two ways that you can use the word of God, talking about this ministry of reconciliation. You can use the word of God like a hammer and you can try to beat people into submission. Or you can use the word of God like a mirror and love them. Amen? Love them into heaven. Praise God. And what we do is we look into the mirror of the word. It actually talks about this in 2 Corinthians 3 at the end of the chapter. And he says this, if the ministry of the condemnation, the old covenant be glorious, how much more does the ministry, he calls new covenant ministry, a ministry of righteousness exceed in glory. Now he talks about when our heart turns to the Lord, Moses put a veil over his face because they couldn't look at him when he came off the mountain with the law. But he says, when that veil is taken away in, in Christ in verse 16. Now the Lord is that spirit in verse 17, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. You know what? You're free to live, love, serve Jesus. You're free to give. You're free to forgive. That's the gospel. That's Galatians, actually. But he says this. He says, but we all with an open face beholding as in a mirror, as in a glass, the glory of the Lord. We look into the word and see Jesus. We are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. So it takes the spirit of God to give you a revelation of the grace of Jesus. Listen, I didn't get a revelation of grace until I had been pastoring for six years. And it completely changed my ministry, completely changed my life. I had people come and say, Pastor, we're struggling from condemnation. I thought, man, these are good people. Why? The? It's because of what I was preaching. Because I preached 90% then about what we have to do and 10% about what Jesus did. But since I got a revelation of grace, I preach about 90% about what Jesus has done and about 10% about what we have to do in response.
And you know what? Jesus has already paid for our sins, paid for our sicknesses, paid for our anxiety, and paid, you know, for our poverty so we can receive His righteousness, His peace, His healing, and His provision. He's already made it available, and all you need to do is believe the gospel. Jesus Christ came for your sin. He lived sinless, holy, perfect. He is the Son of God. He died on the cross for your sins, and God raised Him from the dead the third day and made Him Lord. And if you believe that, you confess, I believe that Jesus is Lord. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that Jesus died for my sins and God raised him from the dead. And God, I'll live for you as you give me the strength. In Jesus' name I pray. If you prayed that prayer I want it, I, with me, I want you to call in today. Praise God, we have trained prayer ministers. If you want to partner with this ministry, we hear from all around the world. We hear, hear from all around the United States. We hear from different countries. The gospel is going forward and people are receiving Jesus. And if, if you right now, you know, need to pray, want to pray, or you want to partner with us, we would love to hear from you today. I want to say a special thank you to all of our partners who are helping us preach this gospel of grace and the unconditional love of Jesus around the world. Praise God. We have a brand new ministry. Praise God. We've got brand new righteousness. We've got brand new life. Amen. It's a ministry of reconciliation, restoring people to right relationship with God. It's not talking about sin. It's not focused on sin. It's focused on the righteousness of Jesus. And when you get that picture, you'll live better accidentally than you ever did on purpose before. Blessings. Thanks for watching Grace for Today. This broadcast is made possible by our faithful partners. If you would like to become a partner, need prayer, or have a question, please call us at 719-418-4000 or go to LawsonPurdue.com or write us at P.O. Box 63733, Colorado Springs, Colorado, 80962. See you next time on Grace for Today.